Let's give people one more minute and then we will get started. Well, first I'll thank Brian Campbell for letting us use this image of the city where we all were hoping to be this week. Um, we'll see if this is the last virtual ITF in this pandemic period or whether we're going to Madrid, hopefully. Um, like all the ITF meetings, this is covered by the note well. Um, you'll find this in the chair slides online and many other places. Um, essentially saying that uh, you should participate uh, with the knowledge that your contributions may be used at the discussion of the ITF and the working group. We have an hours meeting. Um, this is the agenda we have. Um, so the administrivia we're in the middle of, we'll talk about document status. Um, Eva will talk about the Kose X509 status. The editors will talk about the C encoded cert status. Uh, Kyle Den Hartog will talk about an uh, individual draft proposing to register some curves. And that actually brings up a discussion that the chairs and Ben thought it might be useful to have, which is what criteria we want to have for registering additional algorithms within the working group. So importantly, we need people to participate in note taking for us to um, have an official meeting. Uh, so I would like to ask the people present if one or more of you would be willing to collaborate in the uh, uh, collaborative note taking session there looking for volunteers. So Christian, 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 Okay, so we have, um, your idea is not great, but I think we have a minute taker, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. And uh, I'd like some people to also be monitoring the jabber and feel, feel free to interrupt me or the other presenters if something comes up in jabber that you feel should be discussed in real time. All right, are there any amendments that people would like to make to the agenda before we continue. It was noted uh, that there is RAT UCCS that might be worth uh, discussing at the end if we have time. Okay. Um, who proposed that? Christian did. Okay, thank you. All right, um, these are the documents in the working group repository. Um, there are three of them, which are the BIS documents to take COSE to internet standard status. Those are in Auth48 with the RFC editor. Um, in lieu of Jim Shad not being Miller is uh, responding to the Auth48 comments in order to get this done. So look forward to three new 
working group RF internet stand status not too long. Uh, Russ is uh, leading the countersign effort. Uh, Evo is uh, in charge of the X509 effort, and the editors are leading the CBOR encoded cert work. Are, are there any comments that people want to add to document status? All right, well, if that's the case, um, first, um, Matt, I know you don't have slides, but is there anything that you want to say about the, uh, the best documents? Well, first, Russ had joined the queue. I think he had something he wanted to say. Okay, go ahead, Russ. I just wanted to say that with countersign, I think we finished working group last call and uh, we're just waiting on the chairs to push the publish button. Okay, I will take that up with the other two chairs after the meeting and determine if they agree that that's the status unless either of you want to speak up now either confirming or uh, disagreeing with that assertion. Yeah, well, if it's not the case, please point me to the unresolved comments. Who's the shepherd for the document? That should be Michael Richardson. Okay, um, we will look at that. Thank you. Evo, do you want to talk about the X509 document? Uh, yes. So, well, basically there are a few open issues in GitHub and uh, some merge requests in GitHub. And uh, there is a proposal to add uh, some additional text to the document. Uh, so let me walk you through the different uh, points. Uh, there is a merge request from Ben and uh, Michael Richardson. I believe those are uncontroversial and uh, I intend to merge them. Uh, then there is one uh, suggestion, I think it was from Francesca, to uh, add a reference uh, to the document that should also be uncontroversial. At least that's my opinion. If anyone thinks otherwise, uh, please let us know. Uh, and uh, then there are a good number of issues that uh, should be resolved with the merge request uh, uh, from John. Uh, John Matson and uh, there was a discussion with Ben Cohen on in this uh, uh, merge request or pull request, and I think last uh, uh, point that I know for this thing is that uh, we were waiting uh, Ben to say the new text resolves his uh, concerns. Uh, so, Ben, if you could check this, uh, that would be really appreciated. And, uh, yes, Ben? Yes, I will try to do that in the next week or two. Okay, thank you. And uh, then there is uh, one extra issue that was uh, suggesting uh, not using uh, uh, 
shrinks at all uh, for representing some data. In some cases right now we can either have like a binary string if uh, we have only uh, one element uh, present or we have an array uh, if we have multiple elements. And there was a suggestion uh, to simplify the uh, protocol by removing one of the options. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, this might be inconsistent with other places where we are supporting both and uh, I am inclined not to, to take this suggestion uh, but uh, if uh, other people have other opinions uh, uh, I would be interested to know. And the last point is that uh, we were discussing during an interim meeting that uh, probably it would be good to add some more text. What exactly is COSI X509 protecting uh, uh, people from. So uh, for that text, I'm not sure I would be the best person to write it. Uh, is there anyone that feels uh, they might be uh, having the opportunity to do that and uh, appropriate knowledge to do that? You can also reach to us uh, after the meeting. Uh, otherwise, we will discuss uh, and try to uh, pick people individually or uh, collectively with the other chairs, try to write uh, such text. Uh, so from my point of view, those are all the uh, open questions for this document. I really hope we will be able to finish it soon. And uh, there are some external dependencies on the document which uh, kind of try to urge us to finish it sooner. So, or at least uh, provide feedback if we would be changing anything substantial. Uh, so, yes. Are there any questions or comments? Well, I will take that as a no, so uh, yes, let's uh, try to resolve the last point and uh, uh, I will prepare changes for the, or resolve the first few ones and hopefully we'll be able to ship this soon. All right, thank you, Eva. I um, believe the next thing on the agenda is the CBOR encoded CERT presentation. Um, and I invite the presenter to share those slides at this point. Or if you're not sure how to do it, I know how to do it by sharing my screen, which is. I have uh, requested to share there. So. Okay. Uh, that comes. Okay. Uh, Very good. 
Uh, so this is uh, CBOR encoded X509, C509. Uh, this presentation, I think it will be quite quick and it's a bit recap from the previous interim since 110. Uh, we are now at zero 02 and most of the changes we have uh, is um, uh, we have implemented a lot more extensions both from RFC 5280 as well as some other extensions that are used for different certificate profiles. Uh, we have new things are um, RPKI and Russ was uh, nice enough to provide us with an example certificate which we have now support. We also read the GSMA uh, certificate profile for EUICC and adopted the spec to be sure to support that. Uh, Michael has provided a dev ID cert. The spec should be compatible with dev ID, but I will, as soon as I have time, I will test my implementation and the spec with Michael's test certificate and update if needed. It's been updated based on comment from Hillary, Russ and Michael, thanks. Uh, new is that we have test encoded a lot of certificates, certificate change and certificate bags. And we now have uh, tables illustrating uh, the size differences. I will show them here also. Uh, we have added uh, initial C CDDL for assigning requests and certificate revocation lists. Uh, there is a new section on how to implement this in the CA or describing how it can be quite relatively easy as you can be compatible with you, some of your or most of your existing code. Uh, we have released source code for this and there is more source code progressing from Fraunhofer. Mm. Uh, so, as I said, we, the draft now supports uh, all the extensions in 5280, at least all the certificate extensions. I think there are some uh, CRL specific extensions that are not supported yet. Uh, the following are extensions are fully supported. Then there are and more extensions that are only partly supported. And basically every certificate we have seen is supported, but there are some more exotic options or combinations that uh, we uh, do not support in the seaboard encoding. Um, and more comments on these would be very helpful. We will be happy to receive. Then there is here more extensions that are also partly supported. And here we have, for example, the AES resources and the IP resources from uh, from RPKI certificates. Uh, the CSR looks like this, uh, and uh, this was very easy to specify using all the existing definitions. Uh, I think we, right now it's specified that you can request two types of, um, both types of certificates and uh, the, uh, the, the format is compatible with uh, the RFC 2980. Uh, I think the use cases require some Further discussions. We have also not tested this. Uh, there was some discussion of the signature format. And I think also we have comments that attributes are needed for extensibility. That needs further discussion. Um, we have done a similar thing for CRL at some earlier interim. It was suggested that uh, C509 should support uh, signing requests, CRL, and OCSP. Uh, 
I have done the first draft on CRL that was also very easy to using the existing definitions. I think there's some certificate CRL extensions that are not supported. Seaboard encoding of them are not supported. Uh, these have not been tested. Um, I think there could be a discussion if we want is the group still wanting CRL and OCSP and should then should they be in the same document or should they potentially be in another? Um, right now this seems quite easy to include in the same document. Uh, Here is a table showing the sizes uh, of uh, uh, COSI X509 and COSI C509. Um, and it's the first is a very typical IoT certificate. And there's where C509 do a very big, quite big relative um, difference. And general compression algorithm like Rotli doesn't work. Uh, C509 also compresses uh, HTTP certificate chains quite much. Um, and uh, here's two examples. This is our www.itf.org and uh, tools.itf.org. Uh, the next is we have also implemented and tested how C509 works in TLS. In TLS, it's specified as a new certificate format, so it can be combined with certificate compression. Uh, basically, you have done, and if you use C509 as a certificate compression of C509, then you basically can get two layers of compression. Um, here we can see that Brockley does not work for the IoT certificate. Um, and we can see that broadly does not really work on top of C509 in that case. Uh, then we have the RPKI certificate. And then we can see that C509 is, uh, to start with, a bit more efficient than just broadly, and that both combine uh, provides uh, basically one of them provides half size and both of them provides um, a quarter size. And this is quite a large certificate. I don't know how uh, uh, how that well that represents the average RPKI certificate. Then three different, two different, same change and a bag. And uh, as we can see here, um, what you can get all it, Using both C509 and Brotli, you shave basically 400 bytes for these HTTPS shaves. Um, and C509 alone works for short change, but is not very effective on large shaves, as it only currently take each certificate individually, and there is no, it cannot compress anything that is common between certificates in the same chain. But see, using them both it provides a benefit over just broadly. Uh, I think for these are the two main things. Uh, John, we have, a, we have a person in the queue. Yeah, I, I just wanted yeah, to, just to quickly mention that John uh, provided me with uh, um, copies of those <clears throat> chains on the previous slide, and uh, I wanted to apply CBOR pack to it just to see what happens. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I uncovered a bug in my CBOR pack uh, uh, implementation, and uh, I haven't had time to fix that. So I, I would love to report numbers uh, today, but maybe on Friday in, in the uh, CBOR meeting. Yeah, okay, looking forward to that. Um, and here is an issue uh, regarding that. I think um, conclusion on that uh, one option would could provide broadly in the C509 
but uh, that's not very useful for IoT. We discussed that in the interim, and Karsten said we uh, should discuss what the use case is for that. We should also discuss if Seaboard packed uh, how that works, or it can, if it can be used to work better. I think Seaboard packed is, is a better solution for IoT devices. Uh, next step. We have quite a lot of GitHub issues that can be closed. We will, uh, using the sort of uh, provided by Michael, to uh, compress that and fix any things that if it doesn't work. Uh, I will also release some uh, updated version of the my software. I found some bugs and I have now implemented uh, at least uh, most or most of the. Uh, extensions, almost, or maybe some is missing. Uh, then we have this uh, sort of chain bag compression. Uh, we we're looking forward to Kasten's results with Seaboard packed. Um, uh, we will specify a file format, uh, one or several for maybe certificate and serial are different based on draft features on fine magic. Uh, then more validation of different certificates, uh, test compression of CRL. I think more reviews are very welcome. Um, I think the base, the core uh, specification for IoT certificate uh, 7925 seems quite stable at this time point. It has not changed for quite many uh, versions. Any questions or comments? Um. And definitely drop the right yeah. No questions, then I close down. All right. Thank you, John. Um, the next uh, speaker on our agenda is Kyle Den Hartog, who will be talking about an individual draft. Um, about possibly registering pairing friendly curves um, that hopefully we'll all learn some things and get something, uh, some useful actions out of this. Uh, Kyle, go ahead. Not seeing a Kyle in the participant list. You are correct. I was just scanning that as well. Um, he is in New Zealand, so the time may not have been conducive. He's usually very responsible, but. Um, I don't know. Do people want me to step through his slides, which I have not read in detail, and at least have us review them? We can do uh, PowerPoint karaoke, if you will. There does seem to be enough text in the slides that it, it could be worth out, uh, especially given that I don't think there's much else on the agenda. Yeah, the only other thing is AOB. So let's go ahead and uh, try to do that. And this time I figured out with the help of my co-chairs how to use the slide presentation functionality. Um, so um, for the minutes, I'm 
curious what fraction of you, of course, we're not in person. Uh, I can't just have people raise hands easily. I'm curious how many of you have heard of what they call pairing friendly curves in the cryptographic literature. Maybe those of you who know something about it can say something in the chat, uh, just for the record. Um, these are used for zero knowledge proof algorithms, um, some of which are being used in the decentralized identity world at this point. That much background I do know for sure. Um, so Kyle authored this. Uh, there's a company in New Zealand matter that he and some other folks I know are working on uh, did-based identities using verifiable credentials. And there's a scheme for zero knowledge proof called BBS plus signatures. Um, let's see, Dan Benet is, who's a long time ago Usenix friend of mine is one of the bees um, who was the inventors of that signature scheme. And <clears throat> their choice of curves for this scheme is something uh, called BLS 12381, and there's different representations of that. And currently there's no either Jose or Cose uh, registrations for those curves or any of the friends of theirs. So what they've done is <clears throat> They, uh, and, and there is an IRTF document, as he points out, on pairing friendly curves, and that this builds upon that. So the notion of pairing friendly curves is uh, known to the IRTF, which are our crypto experts. Um, and it does registrations for the 128-bit security and 256-bit security curves um, for these curves. A um, number of points, which you can read as well as I, but um, one of them is what's the best way to encode the keys? Um, so, in this working group, we would probably say use a Seabor web key. In the ex Jose working group, we would say you want to use a Jose representation. I know there's other rep representations in the wild uh, for compressed point curves um, that just use the number in the dead world. I'm not advocating that, but I think that's what he's. <clears throat> so I asked a question to Kyle offline. I felt like this was kind of incomplete because curves without corresponding signing algorithms, or at least saying how to make use of them, uh, sort of don't give us an end-to-end -end solution. Now, I recognize that in his use case, um, there's a W3C community group defining the use of this particular BBS plus scheme. And so this would support that. But in general, I would think in the ITF, we want to have sort of end-to-end -end registrations to make things uh, usable. Uh, there's a notion of subgroups to be used with the curve, which I am not enough of a cryptographic mathematical expert to be able to explain that to you. Um, I know some of the proposals have just said uh, represent the subgroups as different curves. There's other possibilities. Um, he's asking what would be the best path forward for this draft. Um, and the last bullet I really can't speak to about curves registered with prohibited steps. I don't know, is, is anybody on the call enough of an expert to shed any light on the last point? 
So I will, I guess, chime in unless Jonathan wants to join the queue. But my understanding here is that the uh, BN256 G1 and G2 are going to correspond to these subgroups that were in the third bullet point. And so my sense is that in general, it's good to have identifiers for these things if we are going to need to refer to them. And the code point space for curve names is not particularly scarce. So on the face of it, the proposal to, to register these, but to have in the comments or, or other notes uh, an indication that these are sort of placeholders. They're not expected to be used for actual signatures, but they might appear in protocol elements that require a curve for some of these other um, uses that take advantage of the, the pairing friendly nature of these curves. Uh, so on the face of it, the proposal to register them but give them a prohibited status does seem to make some sense. But I will yield to Jonathan, who has gotten into the queue. Jonathan? You are muted. Yeah, double click. Um, yeah, so the, the issue with the BN256 curves is that there was there was an attack that reduced, they, they were believed to have 128-bit security, but there was an attack that reduced the security to 100 bits. So um, generally they were, they were uh, well deployed, but there's been a number of efforts in different standards organizations to define new, uh, uh, more secure uh, BN curves. Okay, thank you for that background, Jonathan. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, and he's asking for questions. Um, does anybody want to say anything else about this draft for the meeting minutes? Well, I think the, the oh, sorry, um, I think the one thing we need to discuss at some point is the um, uh, format. So that there are several references to SEC one. Uh, here is that really the form we want these um, to be in, um, or do we actually use something more like OKP? Um, so, um, yeah, I haven't read the IRTF draft. This is uh, apparently based on, so that seems to be stuck on the uh, document shepherd for 54 days. So we probably have to ask Stanislav uh, what status that has. Ben? Um, sorry, I thought I had seen Yaron in the queue as well, so I thought I was going to have a little bit more time. Uh, on the question that Karsten raised about the SEC1 encoding versus OKP, that might actually tie in nicely to the next item on the agenda, which was about the criteria for re registering additional algorithms. Uh, and I think I had kicked off a little bit of a thread that touched on this topic as well. And it seems like the general sense, or I hesitate to use the word consensus, but the general sense I got was that the OKP is generally going to be preferred if there's no specific reason to prefer SEC1. Um, and so I, I would support that since you know, if, if we can use OKP, that would be good. So the question, I guess, would be then to Kyle or to anyone else about whether there's existing deployments where these curves are strongly associated with the SEC1 encoding, uh, because we don't want to go off and do something different just for the sake of something different. Uh, we should try and be consistent with the ecosystem as it stands. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, I propose that we move to the next 
topic, which was actually prompted um, among the chairs because of this presentation. Um, I both to pick uh, the brains of the working group members and uh, possibly Ben as AD. And how should we be thinking about when it makes sense to accept a draft uh, to register new cryptographic algorithms and curves and what criteria we want to apply? I know we are chartered for being able to do that won't stay in existence for, forever, but there may be some additional algorithms and curves coming our way. Um, I'm here to listen, not to uh, drive that. So it's open mic on what algorithms and curves we should be registering and why. And I'll let this go about 10 minutes and then I'll try to save the last 10 minutes for AOB. Uh, Brendan, go ahead. I think there's a, a big argument to be made for uh, starting to register some PQC algorithms. Uh, there's obviously going to be a lot of interest in that, uh, especially once the NIST competition finishes. Um, and certainly there's already been some discussion of these uh, where uh, stateful hash pay signatures are concerned. So I think that we should probably consider uh, taking a role in registering PQC algorithms. Um, let me, as chair, ask a follow-up question. Uh, can you educate us for 30 seconds on the nature of the competition that you're describing and what the outcomes are expected to be. So uh, while I'm by no means an expert um, my uh, on, on this topic, my uh, understanding is that there is uh, an ongoing competition for both key agreement and signing. And so uh, as such, it fits in where uh, we use um, ephemeral static uh, ECD, uh, ECDH, for example, um, and we would probably want to consider something in a similar uh, space. Um, and likewise, there's a number of, uh, of algorithms for, uh, for signing as well. Uh, now, obviously, uh, I think Rust has already put through um, one on the, the topic of uh, stateful hash-based signing. I think we've already registered that algorithm. So uh, along the same vein, I would argue that we probably should be prepared once that, uh, once that finishes to look at uh, registering algorithms for the uh, winners of the, um, uh, of the NIST competitions. That certainly makes sense. Um, Goran, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to chime in also on this on this discussion. So I'm one of the designated experts for certain COSI um, code points. And yep. um, together with Derek and, and Sean, we sort of, we, we were, you, very happy with Jim Shard being around because he was uh, uh, very um, eager to provide input about registration requests. So we, we basically follow, followed his advice. And um, when we now have been asked to review, we have been looking looking at the patents in, in RFC 8152 and so on. Admittedly, it's not, it's not always clear how these registrations should be made. In some cases, it's, it's quite clear. Uh, but there are there are corner cases and so on. Um, so I mean, Jim, Jim he knew uh, very well about Jose and Ikex assignments. So it's a, it's definitely a conscious decision here. 
And, and some of the constructions are made for good reasons. So like, uh, for example, issues with truncation of hash algorithms and how you need to be explicit with that. And, and there are rules like, uh, which, I, I mean, which, which we may, may want to deviate from, but that's, there at least are, are rules now in the current allocations, like signature algorithms are, are typically bundled with a hash function to pre-digest the signature input, but they are not bundled with an elliptic curve. Instead, algorithms use specific key type and the key uh, will indicate the curve. C CRV is one of the cozy key parameters. Uh, another example is Diffie-Hellman algorithms, which are bundled with uh, this designation of ephemeral static, static, but not elliptic curve, and so on. And then there are also exceptions like this ES256K, which is bundling uh, also uh, with, with hash algorithm and, and curve. So I just want to say that if we are deviating from what's currently defined in the COSI NRS, we, we do want to open, open make COSI available for, for many other SDOs and, and, and deployments. I think that's really good. But if, if we had, uh, want to change a lot, then we need to proceed quite carefully because we risk creating a greater mess than it's already there. So we could have a plan for, I think, for, for how to deviate from that or what, how to assign, uh, which probably is something we won't crack in, in, in a working group meeting. We probably need some larger effort beyond that. Uh, another item I'd like to add is that, in particular, we should be careful with short identifiers. They are handed out to applications that really need them. So PQC algorithms would, would probably not fit into the category of short identifiers. Yeah, sure. That's my two cents. Karsten, you're in the queue. Yeah, I got in the queue to just uh, quickly say that uh, just because the NIST competition is complete, doesn't mean that we have an algorithm to register because they usually need some time to write up the result and then to derive some some actually uh, standards uh, uh, compatible uh, description of uh, what what they actually uh, have. Uh, but on on Jörn's point, um, I think uh, we we really need. To address this, uh, I think we actually should write a document <clears throat> that explains our uh, the guidelines that we are using. Um, that will probably at some point become a BCP, but I think it, it's important that we start writing these things up so it's not just law that is uh, traded uh, from the engines, but uh, we can just point to a document, yeah, look, this is what we have decided. and. So one of the things that Ben just said, uh, we prefer OKP over SEG1, but uh, yeah, uh, how, how would a registrant know that? Uh, so I think we really have to write this up and, and start a new uh, document with this, this PCP information. Good point. I, I do know um, that you know, from Jose and some other contexts, we wanted things to be registered that we expect to be commonly used. Uh, not that you couldn't register esoteric things, but uh, there's also the criteria that you, the designated experts at least want to believe that uh, there's been a public cryptographic analysis of the safety and effectiveness of the algorithm. Um, this is where, you know, I'm a complete novice in the pairing friendly curve space, for instance. I would want to defer to the CFRG and our other experts about which of these probably passes muster. That said, we don't want to uh, make experimentation hard by not having common algorithms. So let's see, I'll, I'll recognize Brendan and then I'd like to ask uh, to close this out if Ben wants to say anything from the uh, IESG perspective. Brendan? 
Uh, yeah, so one of the things you just mentioned um, brings up an important topic. Um, you, you said that you, you want some kind of indication that there's been cryptographic analysis and that the algorithms we register have had some kind of security review behind them. Uh, so that brings me to the, the question of what do we do about independent submissions that register a, an algorithm identifier? Uh, to an outside observer, those might appear to have exactly the properties you've mentioned, but because they haven't gone through uh, the regular stream, there's uh, there's no expectation that they have had that review. So um, I'm just curious what the working group's take on that is. I, I do know that our registries have a field for uh, the documents that uh, in which that analysis was supposed to have been done. So we wouldn't even accept a registration if there's no evidence provided. I'm not saying that's a fail-safe check, but it's a start. Okay, thank you. John, and then I'm going to ask Ben to speak. Uh, yeah, I, I think the current recommended column, which have, is it can be yes or no recommended is maybe too little. I think it would be good to have more flexibility here to, to add more information. Um, uh, similar discussions have been had in the TLS working group, which also have a single recommended column. And I think the conclusion in earlier discussions is that that's not enough. It, should be updated in the future. Indeed, Jose has more granularity as a result of some input from Sean Turner when he was AD, but uh, Jose is binary, although I think we have a deprecated or prohibited value as well as yes or no. But Okay, uh, Ben, do you want to make any closing remarks to this discussion and then I'll move on to AOB. Yeah, uh, thanks for passing it over to me. Um, I think the points that definitely that Yaron and Karsten were making are good ones, that you know, it would be good to have some clarity about our expectations and to write it down for so that it's available for people who are asking for registrations. Uh, it's definitely not something we're, we resolved in this session or we're planning to resolve in this session. I'm, I mentioned in the chat, I hopefully Karsten can volunteer to help start writing those down uh, in the form of a draft. Um, and so I, I look forward to seeing that kind of guidance written up. I think it's within the current charter to be able to do that, and it's very useful to do. Um, so I think there's essentially a new milestone that we should put into the data tracker for the working group to, to track this work and how quickly we think we can do it. Um, but I think there were some good, uh, good comments and some good suggestions here. So hopefully we can continue the discussion on the email list. All right, thank you all. Um, let's go to AOB. And there was a request to discuss the RATS UCCS draft. Uh, please come to the Q and uh, speak. Hank, why don't you speak? Uh, yeah, so hi. <laughs> I'm just uh, pressing buttons. So I'm uh, to them here. Let me, let me turn on my camera. Um, hi. Um, so I assume there's a question associated to the topic of UCCS. Well, the first thing is that we maybe could say what it is. Oh, um, okay. Uh, uh, I, uh, I see. <laughs> CWG <laughs> is by definition always protected with a uh, uh, cozy yeah. uh, armor around it. And uh, it turns out you sometimes want to interchange unarmored, unprotected uh, data structures that contain the claim sets from a CWG. So, uh, I mean, this is technically entirely trivial, but uh, we, we have to write it up. 
And we probably also have to write up some security considerations because, uh, yeah, th these are not CWTs, so you cannot use them the same way you would use uh, CWTs. You would use them in communicating about things that might go into a CWT, and you would use them on secure channels. And we have to, to uh, describe what uh, the properties of these secure ch channels are and so on. So this is what the, the UCCS document is about, and Hank has more about that. Okay, yes, that's so, very useful. Go ahead. So, so Jim did not like this. <laughs> so so it's, it's a null cipher in... Uh, no, 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 no. It's let me, not let me finish. looking yeah. like a CWT, so you cannot confuse it with a CWT yes. like let, with let, a nice Let me finish the part. story. Let me finish the story. So yeah. Jim okay. didn't like this because he said it is like a JWT with a null cipher, which is not. Not worse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, JWT. Uh, is the, the null cipher are much worse. That is correct. So, so the, is, if I did you mean is that? It, is it just the CWT claims without the cryptographic wrapper? There, there is a definition in CWT that defines claims sets. Yes. And it is exactly that. It, it okay. Is, it, so, 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 but, but we want to retain um the guarantees that you that, that comes with the cwt so now you need an alternative and the alternative is the conveyance method here and uh yes. that that is then providing this the same guarantees and uh, as, as the cwt would have done an object security and 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 that is that is unfortunately mm, application specific so the guarantees you expect from a CWT are in, intrinsic to the object of the CWT, but they are not intrinsic to the arbitrary channel that is secured somehow. So these right. channels have to be established under certain circumstances. When you receive something that is a claim set, then you suddenly are burdened with responsibility. Maybe yes. it's the burden of the responsibility of the issuer. Maybe it's a dedicated role that you define in your scenario. And, and therefore, you can't just define UCCS as the claim set that are encased in a CWT and done. No, you have to always provide, and I think there was Carlson hinting at, a, a security consideration that is specific to the user scenario. And uh, and uh, but 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 the, the core, of course, is relatively easy. It's 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 an unprotected claim set. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important I, to to clarify this because the UCCS is an unprotected <laughs> claim set. It's unprotected, and the rest of the document is a little bit speculative and tells you what properties a secure channel might have to have, so you can make useful use of an UCCS in the same way that you could make use of a CWT. And it's a bit unfortunate that, that we, we are forced to put the two things into a single document uh, because it really confuses the issue, but that's where we are. Uh, I'll state not wearing my chair hat, just as a point of comparison, OpenID Connect does utilize a JOT set in one flow without it being a jot. There's this thing called a user info endpoint, which must be protected by TLS, where you send claims about the end user, such as your first and last name, if you choose to disclose those, that are just sent as bare claims. Now they use the jot registrations, but they're protected by TLS, not protected by JWS, as a point of comparison that is in the wild. Yeah, I think we have to, uh, uh, if, if it's comparable, we have to check that. Because every, um, let's call it, um, similar example, a proof of concept here is is is, is uh, extending the, the intuitive uh, uh, yeah, message that we want to convey here. Uh, but it is not intuitive, unfortunately, without context. 
and and yeah, maybe, maybe in another example would provide that. Thank you. I'm putting that into the chat for the minutes. Yeah, for the thank you. So there was a lot of arguing, and then we are closing to the uh, bottom of the hour. But there was a lot of arguing. Uh, can we just say UCCS is a standalone claim set? And I think the uh, still I'm, I'm convinced that the answer is no. It has to be context specific due to their security uh, uh, considerations in the context. Okay, well, this is certainly a relevant topic. Thank you for the explanation. We are at time. Does anybody want to make a final remark or otherwise we'll uh, end here and thank you for your participation. Yeah, I was just going to jump in to say thanks to Hank and Carson for letting us know about UCCS and why it's not as simple as it might appear. Um, it seems like we should probably continue discussion about that on the um, is the rats group that's in, Kirsten, on, on the appropriate list where, where the document is actually homed, which I'm pretty sure is rats, but uh, we will check shortly. Uh, but thank you again for, for bringing it up here. But that was all I had to summarize. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you in another meeting or on the list. Take care. <laughs>